you. You know that the word of God says that his promises are yes and amen. Everything that God says is true. He is not a man that he should lie. But when he speaks something in his word, it is for you. And when he speaks something to you in your time of prayer, in your time of worship, you cling to it, you write it down, and you confess it. Because your circumstances may not look like that, but God will come through on what he spoke. So we're gonna worship together. Y'all can shout it out because he is a good, faithful God. They say this mountain can't be moved. They say these chains will never break. But they don't know you like we do. There is power in your name. We've heard that there is. Well, good morning. Welcome to Worship at Oak Hills. My name is Jerry. My name is JD. We're so glad you're joining with us this morning. I think it's going to be a great one. What do you think, Jerry? It's going to be amazing. Actually, I think your hearts are going to be blessed as we hear our children's choir. That's yeah. just a little hint right there. But but no, it's going to be a wonderful morning of worship. Man, Palm Sunday has arrived, and we're so glad that you're joining us wherever you are. I just want to encourage you. 
jump on to the chat. Let us know how we can pray for you. If you have comments, I mean, today's gonna be quite the informational day. We're, we're very excited about it. If you, if you wanna drop in some comments on the chat, that's why we're here. We are an online church, really just trying to create that uh, community. And one thing I wanna note, and we mentioned this before, but if you cannot get to a physical location, we understand that. There's tons of different scenarios and, and people that we've talked to and prayed with, but we do have online groups for you. We know that it can be difficult to have that community, have that uh, discussion time where you're digging into to Bible studies and things. And Jerry, you know, um, man, the ability to be able to join together in an online group. I mean, that's huge. That's that's what the church yeah. is for. Yeah, and to be able to, to you know, even if, if you know, for only the, um, when you're looking at the chat right now, if you were to be able to step into that group during the week and reconnect during the week to talk with one another, encourage each other's hearts, to care for one another and pray for one another, it's an important part of our online groups is to, to be able to do that. Right. Well, I want to say good morning to, to Franny, to, to Welcome Granny, in. Franny and Granny, and then we also have Carlos, we've got Berta, yeah, um, Jeff, got Jeffrey, got on. Roosevelt, and Rena. Great to have you all worshiping with us this morning, and we hope your hearts are encouraged as we as we celebrate together. Well, this morning um, we like to have focuses, and so this morning's focus is going to be on church. Why do we go to church? And I don't know if you've asked yourself that. Is it important to go to church? Well, we want to kind of open that up for discussion. I want you to jump in the chat as we are talking about some of the thoughts that we have when we read scripture. I'd love to get some of your thoughts. When maybe you've had this conversation with some of your family members or friends, especially when you think about Easter coming up, that's like that invite time. So some of these conversations might come up when people are like, well, why, why would I come to Easter service? Or yeah, why would I go point. to a church service? I think this is, this is quite the time to discuss why go to church. So Jerry, when you point. think about that, when you think about like the conversations you've had in the past and yeah. just what would you what well would you suggest? so so when you when you were raised did you were you in church every Sunday? Every Sunday, or every you, Wednesday too. We we were almost every Sunday. We were mm -hmm. Wednesday. Of course, the, the church I was at, all our, our school was there too. So oh, we would be in okay. school every day of the week. We we're at the church. Oh, so dang. like like our whole life on Saturday, I'd you be like mowing the lawn. You, you win. Know? So <laughs> so so church was a central, like a really important part okay. of our daily life yeah. as a family as well as a community. Being there, knowing one another, being a, um, a, you know being able to get to know others and, and care for one another. So that's how we, how we were raised. But but what does scripture say? Really, when, when we look at Ephesians chapter 5, yeah. if he, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter 1, actually, um, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1 that, that, that the Father placed all things under Jesus' feet, mm. and then from there he says, and the church, which is his body, which is the full expression of God, of Jesus Christ in us. And, and that, that's the part that I think is really unique there, is that the church is the full expression of God. And I'm talking about not just the Big C Church, which it is, but I'm talking about the local expression as, as the Spirit of God is in each one of us, and we come to church, we gather together as the body of Christ, it's that moment when the fullness of God, somehow the fullness of God is represented in that. And, and we experience that fullness when we're together at, at, as a church, right? Yeah. So to me, that, that's probably one of the more important parts of why we come together to church and why not to, to avoid that's it or, or not be a part of it for you. When you think about it, what, what have you sensed or experienced as you read scripture about church and why it's important? Well, it's interesting. First and foremost, what you first said, it's almost like I think there was a part of me because I grew up doing it would have been my yeah. answer. And that may have been your answer as you're even thinking about it now, like, you know, what, what did your parents tell you growing up? Um, so initially, before I made my faith my own, it was because my parents were telling me to go. Now, I think it's definitely evolved a lot of different ways for me. And I don't know about you, but for me, it's that community side of it, right? So we know the word talks about, do not forsake the gathering of the saints. But also in Hebrews chapter uh, 10, I'm gonna just read this verse. In verse 24 of chapter 10, it says, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see that day drawing near, that day is when Jesus yeah. Christ comes back on his white horse, comes back for his people. Right. But until that day, that's what he's saying. Let's not neglect to meet together. So yeah. what he's saying is let's, let's join together. He's talking about joining in the, in the early church sense. And, mm -hmm. and currently as we're talking about why should you join the church? Mm -hmm. what, should you come together as church members? Yes, uh, because we are here to encourage one another. When you think about Adam and Eve, they were, they were created for community. Right? The disciples went out by twos because of that community. The word talks about how good is it for someone to have a friend to help him up when he falls down. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just so many, I think it's well way through scripture, honestly, the, the, the impact that the church can have of praying people. When yeah. you think about Esther, she, had, she yeah. had a whole group of Jews yeah. praying for her, but when she went to the mm -hmm. throne room before she was, if he didn't put that separate down, she would die. And so she was going and she had all these Jews fasting and praying for us. 
we have we have people praying for you for each other we have we have prayer this morning jump in the chat and you'll have people pray for you i'm going to pray for you and so there right. there's an element of prayer there's an element of community right. um, and definitely like you said as yeah. well and susie susie brought up here she says gather together gives us encouragement e echoing what you're talking yes. about and what 100%. the scripture was you're reading right so thank you susie that that's that's exactly right and so so that's one of the things that we we want to make sure that we understand the why behind why we're doing what we're doing that we're not just showing up doing it because it's a habit, right. which is not a bad habit. Because well, our right? parents told us to do right. it, right? Yeah, exactly. But it's it's about gathering because when we come together, our hearts are encouraged. Our focus is set on things above, mm -hmm. worshiping our Creator, worshiping God the Father and Jesus who gave His life for us. All of that is such an important part of expression of what it means to walk as Christians, to fo be followers of Jesus. And when you think about this, here's another element of it, the Big C Church, right? So you've probably heard that phrase, and if you haven't heard it, it just means the church that's bigger than your local body, right? So we have our local church here. Ours is Oak Hills Church. Um, but there's churches all over. There's all over the country all over the state and then all over the world, of course, right? So there's churches that were all on the same mission of being more Christ-like. That's, that's our goal is to represent Christ to the world, is to reach um, new people to, hey, say, listen, let me tell you about the gospel. Let me tell you about how good Jesus is. So when you think about praying for another church in another area, think about the Middle East right now, as we're praying for Israel, as we're praying for the churches in Israel, as we're praying for the churches that are going through uh, different issues in Africa right now, and in China with the underground church, when you're just considering the the, the global scale of church that is that's going through things, we're meant to pray for one another. I mean, that's the beauty of, of being the Big C Church also. So it's praying for the local body with encouraging right. messages and being able to, to see one another, to praise with one another, the that's goodness right. of God, and be able to join together in worship. But it's also to be like, listen, there's other people hurting. I'm going to pray for them. I care for them. You think about the Pauline letters and the different letters in the, in the gospel and the New Testament included, all of those books, a lot of those, man, the authors are saying, let me give praise to, to, to some people at this local church, at this local church. And, and listen, I would just want to tell you guys, I'm praying for you guys. And this church, they're thanking for, for what you've given to them. And so it's, it's so tied. There's like a network yeah, in the New yeah. Testament of churches that are praying for one another, financing one another, loving one another, caring and sending out disciples to one another, all of, to get the message yeah. of the gospel out. Yeah, and, and, to, to, and to think that we sit here today because of those first disciples that went out is, is remarkable that 2,000, more than 2,000 years later, this is the outcome of us sitting today to talk about and refer back to the early days of that church, right? That's mm -hmm. pretty cool. Well, J.D., we've got some incredible opportunities for worship coming up. We've got uh, Good Friday services coming up. It's going to be this next Friday. We'll be streaming two services at 6 o'clock and at 7.30 in the evening. And that time will be a time of reflection, coming back to think about um, the sacrifice of our Savior, the Lamb of God, who, who, who atoned for our sins and, and to reflect back on his sacrifice and his suffering for us. So, so it'll be this coming Friday, again, streaming live at both 6 o'clock and 7.30. And then Easter, J.D., tell us about Easter. Easter's going to be a great day. And listen, if you're in our area, we'd love for you to join us. Come here. We're going to have photo ops. We're going to have just a family fun environment. And it's also, you know, I mentioned earlier, but this is an invite time. You know, Jerry, yes. when you think about That's how right. you can invite your neighbors and stuff, you think Easter and Christmas. Mm -hmm. Like, those are the two big ones. So I want to encourage you, if you That's guys right. are in the chat, think about maybe you can drop some ways. How would you invite your friend? How would you invite your neighbor? Just go ahead and jump in the chat mm -hmm. and let us know how you would invite somebody because Easter is going to be one of those amazing uh, mornings where we're just going to be joining together with people who maybe come once or twice a year, right? This is our opportunity and, yep. to get them in the fold. And Judy, it might be that you're inviting them over into your house because you're streaming live yeah. and you live in, in um, Maryland, you live in some other state where it's not going to be possible to actually get to the building. So so we understand it. We invite you just invite your friends or neighbors over to, to worship together maybe on that Easter and do maybe a watch party or a worship party there at your house, right? Yeah. So but we have four services. They're going to be at different times than our normal services. So bear in mind that it's 7.30, 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock, and then also 1 o'clock. Again, 7.30, 9 a.m., and then 1, 11 a.m., and then 1 p.m. So that's for just that that, that Easter um, morning um, service times. And then the next week, we'll, we'll go back to our regular service times that, that we are like today, that we're doing today. So. And this morning, we're celebrating Palm Sunday. And we mentioned this before, but we're excited to have David Brickner with us. Uh, he yes. represents Jews for Jesus. And he's going to come, and he's going to share some great information on what that Seder meal looked like on that Monday, Thursday night when they were joining together for that mm -hmm. Last mm -hmm. Passover supper. It's going to be right. a great morning. We're going to have our our children join us. You mentioned that uh, they're going to be yeah. joining us on stage, joining us in worship, and we want you to join us in worship right now. Yeah. If you got coffee, grab yeah, your dude, coffee, yep. grab your family together. We're going to take communion together. We're going to hear from David Brickner. It's going to be yeah. a great morning. So won't you join us in service?
this morning. I hope you came ready to worship the King of Kings. I hope you came ready to sing. Come on, let me see your hands. Let's go. special Sunday. We've got some of the best worship leaders in the world. I'm actually going to move out the side so y'all can see them. Kids praises with us this morning. Come on, give it up. Make some noise. I've already cried like four times today, so don't worry. You'll, you'll get there with me. I promise. Hey, as we worship this morning, I just want to say these, these kids have inspired me watching them worship with authenticity, with a purity of heart. And so I want to invite you into that space this morning. I want to invite you to focus on Jesus. We are here for him and him alone. So as we sing these songs, as we worship together, as we hear from his word this morning, I just want to invite you just to focus on him, to lay aside all distractions, to give him your attention, give him all the glory, all the honor, 
and all the adoration. He's worthy of a church. Come on, let's sing together.
generation of worship leaders in this house. Woo! You may be seated. How cool was that every generation joining together in one voice? Let me tell you, here at Oak Hills Church, we are not just ministering to the next generation. We're setting up the next generation to minister because they are not the church of tomorrow. They are the church of right now. Come on, one more time. Let's give it up for these guys. So thankful for all the team setting them up and preparing them for this moment. Well, let me tell you about another moment coming today. And if, if you're brand new, maybe this is your first time ever here at Oak Hills Church. We want you to know we are so thrilled that you're in this place. Welcome. Welcome. You've come on a special day because we have a very special guest with us today. David Brickner, who has been with us before, is with us once again today. The thing that you need to know about David is he is the executive director of Jews for Jesus and has been since 1996, 28 years. And underneath his leadership, they have advanced internationally. Uh, you need to know that they have missionaries around the world, but no larger number of missionaries than what they have right in Israel. And we're going to get to hear just a little bit of an, an update about that today. But we are so excited to have David, who was born in Boston, Massachusetts, to Jewish parents. He is fifth generation follower of the Messiah, Jesus. And we're so happy to have him. I cannot wait for us to hear the message today. Church, will you welcome David Brigner? Thank you, Travis. All right. Thank you. Shalom. It's great to be back at Oak Hills, and some of you don't know about Jews for Jesus, think it sounds like vegetarians for meat, right? <laughs> But Jesus is Jewish, and his first followers were all Jewish. And actually, we're going to be talking about Christ and the Passover today, since this is Holy Week. But you know what? Actually, today is another Jewish festival called Purim, which is recounted, the story of which is in the book of Esther. God has been delivering his people from all kinds of conflicts, from Egypt, from Haman, and he will deliver us from Hamas as well. You know, hallelujah. 28 years ago, Jews for Jesus only existed in North America. Now we are the largest evangelistic outreach to Jewish people in the land of Israel. And I was just there two weeks ago for two weeks. And uh, I want to tell you, if you've been to Israel before, you'll notice a difference going after October 7th. Israel is a country that has experienced trauma and continues to. You walk off of the plane and down a broad a hallway to passport control and on either side of this hallway are giant pictures of the faces of the men and the women and the children who are still hostages. And we say, bring them home now. And that's the trauma that is all over the land. The posters are on the buildings. The, the slogan is on the lips of every Israeli. And it's tragic. It's tragic what's going on on both sides of the border. But you know what? God works through those kinds of tragedies. And I want to tell you he's working today. Jewish people, Israelis, are coming to faith in Jesus through the 50-plus missionaries that we have in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, all over the land. When I was there, we were still ministering and providing food. I had a group of guys from Texas who came over with me to volunteer, and we went down to Ramon, which is the largest army base. It was a group coming out of Gaza, had been there for two months, and we put on a barbecue, a Texas barbecue for them, and we told them, Texas love loves Israel, we love Israel, and Jesus loves Israel, and we put, cooked about 240 pounds of steak for those guys, and they were blessed and wanted to know more, and uh, I'll tell you one other story that, real quickly, 
Uh, there was a, a memorial service that we held for October 7th, and we invited the community, and a bunch of Israelis came. Knowing who we were, we were lighting candles in memorial. We were reciting psalms and singing songs together and praying a lot. And here are all of these Israeli unbelievers listening to this message. And afterwards, this guy Simon came up, and he was livid. Orthodox Jewish guy in his mid-twenties, and he said, I'm going to let this go for now because of what this was all about, but I am furious with the, you people. He had so many objections. We said, well, Simon, why don't you come back next week? You'll see a more typical service that we have at our congregation here. Well, we didn't think he was going to come after that, but he did. He showed up with questions of a very different sort. Because you see, in the interim, Simon had had a vision of Jesus and had come to believe in him. Hallelujah. Who would have imagined? This guy was born again before he knew what the term meant. And he's been baptized and is now being discipled by our staff. And that's just one example of what God is doing. So we want to ask you to continue to, as the scriptures say, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And when you pray for that, you're praying for the salvation of souls, Jews and Arabs. Because when Jews and Arabs say to one another, I love you in Jesus' name, the world will see the reconciling power of the gospel. It's the only hope. Amen? Amen. The Passover is all about the gospel. And we remember that today as a demonstration that God keeps his promises. He's faithful. He told the patriarchs that they would go to Egypt, but God would bring them out. And he kept his word, and in so doing, wove into the very fabric of that story a picture of the greatest redemption of all. To that we turn now, which is found in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 12, and we'll be reading from verse 5. Now, if you remember at this time, Israel was in bondage. We were enslaved in Egypt, and God promised he was going to bring us out. And so he raised up Moses and sent him to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh wasn't willing to let him, let him take the people of Israel out. And so God sent a series of plagues on the land of Egypt, ten in all, and the tenth was the worst of all, the death of the firstborn. And in order that this plague should not come upon the Jewish people, God commanded that they take a lamb. One lamb for each family, and that's where we pick up the story, Exodus 12, verse 5. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect. And you may take them from the sheep or the goats, take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Verse 11, this is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, eat it in haste, it is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. So this is the first celebration of Passover in Israel the night of the 10th plague. But God commanded that we continue to celebrate this as a lasting ordinance. And so throughout Israel's history, as we observe Passover, there were various symbols and, and items added to remind us of that first Passover so that by the time Jesus and his disciples were celebrating, all but two of the items that you see on this table today were incorporated into that observance. Now, of course, the most significant Passover that Jesus and his disciples celebrated was that one in the upper room in Jerusalem. The Last Supper was a Passover. 
So then how much more significant does this feast come to be for us who are followers of Jesus in light of all that he said and did on that night he was betrayed? Passover is observed in the home around the family dinner table and it begins with the lighting of the Passover candles to usher in the celebration. This is the honor and duty of the mother of the house who takes this book called Haggadah. Haggadah is a Hebrew word that means the story or the telling and all of the liturgy, the prayers, the story of the Passover is found in this special book. And so the mother takes the Haggadah and she lights these candles as she leads the family to begin the worship. And I'm going to say this in Hebrew and then I'm gonna ask ladies if you would take this brochure and open it up and you'll see right in the middle section the blessing over the candles. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher kitshanu b'mitzvotav V'tzivanu lahad likner Shel yom tov Amen Ladies, together in English Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us by his commandments and commands us to kindle the festival lights. Now I think it's appropriate that it is the woman rather than the man who lights the candles and so brings light to the festival table. Because you see, in the same way, it was not through a man, but through a woman and the will of God that the light of the world came into the world. As the prophet Isaiah declared, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you will call his name Emmanuel, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of my people Israel. And at this time now, our Passover celebration can begin. Now, if you notice here in front of you, there are four cups. Actually, these four cups represent one cup per person, which we drink from four different times. Each time, the cup is given a different name and significance. And so, at the beginning, after the lighting of the candles, we take the first cup, which is called the cup of sanctification, because everything in Passover is sanctified. And there's a traditional Hebrew prayer that we say over this Kiddush cup, Kiddush meaning holy or sanctified. And I'm gonna say that prayer in Hebrew. This is the same prayer that certainly Jesus said when he was celebrating Passover in the upper room. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Borei peri hagafen Amen. Together, everyone in English. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, king of the universe who creates the fruit of the vine. And then Jesus said, it is with great desire that I've desired to eat this Passover with you. But I tell you truly, I will not partake of the fruit of the vine again until I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. See, everything in Passover is sanctified and blessed and everything has a particular order to it as well. Now, Seder, is the Hebrew word for order. Passover is referred to as a Seder meal, and this is a Seder plate. And despite its appearance, it's not for deviled eggs. <laughs> the compartments on the Seder plate actually correspond to these various food items on display down through here. A little bit of each is placed in the compartments. And the first that we have is carpus, which is the Hebrew word for greens, parsley. And the greens represent life. And we will take some salt water, which represents the tears of life, and we dip the greens into the salt water, and so we are reminded during our slavery in Egypt, our lives were immersed in tears. A life without redemption is a life immersed in tears. But we also remember that God redeemed us. With a mighty outstretched arm, he brought us out of bondage through that salty Red Sea into freedom. And so now, by his mercy and his grace, we have been redeemed from the tears of bondage. We eat the greens to remind us that that's the life we now partake of. The second item on the Seder plate, <sighs> horseradish. <laughs> We call it Jewish Claritin. (laughs) 
guaranteed to unclog the sinus passages in the back of your head. (laughs) Now the horseradish is the very bitter herb that we read about in Exodus 12. God commanded Israel to eat back in Egypt. And it's called maror in Hebrew, also known as the sop. And what we do is we take some of the unleavened bread and we say the blessing over it. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Amen. Together in English. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And then we take this bread and we dip it into the maror, getting, oh, maybe a teaspoon of it on there like this. And then, I'm not going to do it. (laughs) You know what happens when you eat this much? You begin to cry. (laughs) Very little choice in the matter. But you see, the tears that we shed are a graphic reminder of the tears our forefathers shed during slavery in Egypt. Now, you might remember when Jesus celebrated Passover in the upper room with his disciples, he had said to them, one of you is going to betray me. And the disciples got all upset. They said, Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? And Jesus said, the one who dips in the sop with me this night, that one will betray me. You remember that? Well, here's the irony. Every one of the disciples dipped in the sop with Jesus that night. Every one of them. And every one of them also betrayed him, didn't they? Even Peter, who said, oh, I'll never betray you. Three times he denied even knew him. But then later on in the Seder, as it's recounted in the Gospels, Jesus himself does take the bread, and he hands it to Judas Iscariot, and he says, what you must do, go and do quickly. And the Bible tells us that when Judas took the bread with the sop, Satan entered into him, and he went out into the night. Maror, bitterness and tears. The next item on the Seder plate is called Cha-ro-seth. Can y'all say that? Cha-ro-seth. Not bad, but you do have to get the ch in there, right? <laughs> Just don't look at your neighbor when you say it, all right? Cha-ro-seth is a sweet mixture. Chopped apples and nuts, honey, raisins, cinnamon. It's delicious, but it represents the mortar that we used to make bricks for Pharaoh during our slavery in Egypt. Kind of looks like mortar. And so you might say, well, wait a minute, Rabbi. If cha represents mortar for bricks, why is this so sweet? Ah, because you see, even the bitterest of our toils grew sweet when we knew that our redemption drew near. And so we take that bread again and dip it in. Maybe this time we get a double portion on there. (laughs) But what we find is that as we eat this mixture, you know, the bitter taste still in our mouths from that horseradish, it disappears in the sweetness of the haroset, which teaches us that even the bitterest things that we must face in this world can be sweetened by the hope and promise of redemption. This is hazeret, the bitter root itself, a horseradish root or an onion, just rests on the table as a symbol that not only are our experiences in life often bitter, the reason for that is that the very root of life is bitter. Sin has caused our hearts and this world to be a broken place. But there is hope because anyone who is in Messiah, what, has become a new creature. And that's good news indeed. Now, these last two items on the Seder plate are the only two missing when Jesus celebrated Passover. And you'll understand why they were in just a moment. This is called Chagiga. As you can see, it's a brown egg that has been hard-boiled. Now, Chagiga not only means egg, but it also is the name given to the Passover sacrifice that was made in the temple in Jerusalem. So we're going to peel the egg at Passover. We're going to slice it. And before we eat the slice, we're dipping it into the salt water, which represents tears because we are mourning the fact that this is a memorial to a sacrifice that can no longer occur since the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem. 
It was standing when Jesus was there, but he predicted that very event which occurred not a generation after he died. And when he died on the cross, the veil that separated us from the holy place in that temple was rent from top to bottom. And fellowship was established as Jesus fulfilled the sacrificial system. But for my people who have yet to receive Jesus, there's mourning for the loss. In fact, the rabbis tell us we shouldn't even eat lamb anymore as the main course. We have some other meat like brisket and this Zeroa, this shank bone of a lamb, sits on the table as the last item to remind us of those lambs so central to that first Passover in Egypt, but so sadly absent from Passover tables today. And we read about those lambs in Exodus 12. God commanded they be yearling male lambs without spot, without blemish, without any broken bone. We were to take that lamb and sacrifice it. And of course, this is the picture, is it not, of one perfect Passover lamb who contrary to Roman custom did not have his legs broken when he hung on the cross. And so did Jesus fulfill that important messianic type and prophecy. We come now to the second cup, which is called the cup of plagues. We don't drink from this cup, but rather dip our finger in the cup and drop one drop for each of the 10 plagues, remembering the blood, hail, locusts, boils, cattle disease, darkness, slaying of the firstborn. Nine times Pharaoh hardened his heart, and each time God sent a plague on the land of Egypt. But the 10th plague was the worst of all, the death of the firstborn. Now God told the children of Israel to take the blood of that sacrificed lamb in a basin to go outside of their homes and apply it to their doorposts, putting it on the top lintel and the two side posts. The blood of the lamb on the top lintel and the two side posts, making the sign of a cross with the blood of the lamb on that doorpost. That night, Death flew through the land of Egypt. There was weeping and wailing as never before till Pharaoh cried out, let them go or I'll die. But everywhere that the blood of the lamb was on the top lintel and the two side posts, death passed over that house. And so redemption came that night to the people of Israel in the land of Egypt. Now, because I believe in Jesus as my Messiah, and because I have by faith applied the blood of his sacrifice to the doorpost of my heart, When death comes to visit me, death is going to pass over me also because I have eternal life. Praise God for that. Hallelujah. This is called a matzah tosh. Matzah being the unleavened bread, tosh meaning bag, and that's what this is. Actually, there are three pieces of bread inside the matzah tosh. Three pieces of bread, one bag, the rabbis writing in the Haggadah tell us, well, that's because the matzotash represents a unity, but they don't agree which one it is. One says it's the unity of the Jewish people of Israel, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Another writes, no, it's the unity of worship in the people of Israel, the high priests, the Levites, and then the people. And on go several more explanations. Well, I believe the matzotash represents a unity also. I believe the matzotash represents the unity of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And here's why. During a particular time of the Passover, we will reach into the second or middle compartment of the matzotash, and you can ask the rabbis, why do we take the second piece and leave the first and third pieces hidden? And the answer is, (laughs) it's tradition. (laughs) Now this unleavened bread, unleavened being a symbol of sinlessness in the Bible, is also, you'll notice, as we make it pierced. You may be able to see the flame of the candle through the bread because we poke it with holes as we bake it on a rack, these stripes. Unleavened, striped, and pierced. We take the second piece from the matzotash middle and we break it. Taking this broken piece, we wrap it now in a linen cloth or in a linen bag, calling it afikomen, which simply means it comes later. And that's exactly what happens. We take this broken piece and carry it outside of the room of celebration to be hid for a time. 
buried, if you will. And this is so important that the entire celebration cannot be completed without that second piece. And we'll get back to that in just a minute. But I'm curious, how many of you have never been to a Passover before? Wow. Most of you. Well, if you should ever have the opportunity, whether it be a banquet that you are invited to or a Jewish friend who invites you over to the home, I encourage you to go. But let me warn you, if you're going to a Passover, eat lightly that day or not at all because you are really in for a meal. (laughs) I want to assure you Passover is much more than parsley and horseradish. I mean, we eat and we eat and we eat. In fact, there's a Jewish tradition that says this Passover is like this. All the festivals are like this. They tried to kill us, we won, let's eat. (laughs) Unfortunately, that's the part of the Passover I forgot to bring with me today. So in lieu of that sumptuous meal, I want to just point you to this brochure once again. And uh, you'll notice there's a way for you to be involved in Jews for Jesus, to hear the stories of what I shared with you just recently about what happen- what's happening in Israel, to pray for us. So if you'd like to do that, you can actually just tear off this third panel, fill it out, and drop it in the offering boxes on the wall as you leave the, the service. We'll really appreciate the opportunity to be in touch with you, keep you informed. Sha'alu shalom Yerushalayim, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We need your prayers. We've come to the meal of the end of the meal, and I hope you've all had enough to eat, because the last part of the Passover is the most important for we as followers of Jesus to understand. Towards the end of the meal, as they're wrapping up, maybe having dessert, the father, the head of the house, will say to all the children, go find the afikoman. Now, they didn't see where it was hidden. So they get up, which is a good thing to do after a big meal, and they go running around the house, which kids love to do, because the child who finds that second piece is rewarded. <laughs> and they, he brings it back, she brings it back to the head of the house, and he rewards the child and then stands and continues this ancient ceremony by unwrapping the bread from the linen cloth, breaking off small pieces, and handing it to everyone seated at the table. Everyone now receives a piece of this bread. Does this remind you of anything? You see, brothers and sisters, if the matzotash represents the unity of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, why is that middle piece broken, buried, and brought back? If the matzotash represents the unity of worship, the priests, the Levites, and the people, why is the middle piece broken, buried, and brought back? But if the matzotash represents the unity of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then we know why. It's because Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, was broken in death, wrapped in a linen cloth, buried in the tomb, and then brought back, resurrected by the power of God, conquering sin, conquering death. Oh, hallelujah. So then it is no wonder that Jesus that night in the upper room took this very bread and broke it and gave to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. In just a few minutes you're going to receive this bread and now you have the rest of the story like Paul Harvey said. You see the picture. And then he took the cup Well, now you know we take the cup four times during Passover, so which time was it? Thankfully, the scriptures tell us that he took the cup after they had supped. At the very conclusion of the meal, the last morsel eaten is the afikomen, and right after comes the third cup, which is the cup of redemption. Looking back to the redemption God brought our forefathers and looking forward to that redemption when Messiah comes. And Jesus at the climax of his celebration of Passover in the upper room, having taken the bread, raises this cup up and declares, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. He was instituting it right then and there. And there's only one place where that word, Habrit Chadasha, the new covenant, is mentioned in the Hebrew scriptures, and that's Jeremiah 31, beginning with verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. And it won't be like the old covenant when I took Israel out of Egypt, but I'll write my law on their hearts, I'll be their God, 
and I'll forgive their sin. And when Jesus declared the new covenant, he was foreshadowing the forgiveness of sin that he would purchase through his own death, burial, and resurrection. And now we have these symbols today to remember it began at Passover. It was fulfilled on the cross and through the resurrection, and we get to be a part of it. Praise his name. Isn't that wonderful? Hallelujah. God wove this stuff right through the story. And you can see his handiwork. You can see his fingerprints on the pages of the scriptures and on history so that we can know and believe and give thanks and praise, which is the only true response. Give thanks and praise and come and receive him if you haven't yet. Passover concludes with thanks and praise. We take the fourth cup, which is called Hallel. You all know hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallel, praise. The cup of praise is raised as we sing hymns of praise and conclude the Passover with this stunning remark. Lashana haba Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem. Because you see, Passover not only speaks of a redemption in the past, but it speaks of a redemption still awaited. A future hope. <laughs> And therein lies the burden of my heart and Jews for Jesus. We have that hope. But so many of my people will celebrate Passover and say, we're still waiting. They don't know of that one named Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, who came in fulfillment of all the hope and all the promise of all the prophets. Do you know him? If you do, would you be burdened along with us that the Jewish people in San Antonio, your neighbors and friends, the Jewish people in Israel who are in mourning, that all would come to know this hope. Hallelujah. I want to bless you. <laughs> There's a blessing that God gave to the sons of Aaron, the Levites, the high priest, he said, bless my people with this blessing, Numbers chapter six, and my people will be blessed. So receive this blessing in Hebrew and English. Yisa Adonai Panavlecha Vyosem Lecha Shalom May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Bashem Yeshua, Mishichinu, Sar HaShalom, in the name of Jesus, our Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Thank you. In just a moment, we're going to get to share in communion together, so you may want to get those communion elements ready, or if you're worshiping with us online, get that bread and that cup ready. But before we do that, I want you to know, there, there are many of you, you have already begun a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you have found that hope that David was talking about, maybe even years ago. But I'm wondering if maybe there are some of you here today who you are just considering beginning a relationship with Jesus. You are searching. Maybe when David was talking about the, the bitterness of life, you said, I, I've tasted that. And maybe there's something, just like the kids who were searching for that, that piece of bread, maybe today is the day that you have found Jesus, maybe for the very first time, and you're searching for that hope. Every time that we meet here at Oak Hills Church, we do not want anyone to leave without it being very clear, the opportunity to make a decision to begin that relationship with Jesus. If that's you, I want you to know we've been praying for you. 
This morning, we woke up this morning thinking about you and praying for you. We want everyone to experience that hope, the resurrected Savior. And so we want to pray together. If you have never surrendered your heart to Jesus, let now be the moment. Let today be the day. How do you begin a relationship with Jesus? Well, you just begin a conversation with him. You pray to him and you let him know that you believe that he is truly the son of God and that he has the power to forgive sins and that he was raised from the dead on the third day. Scripture tells us that he who believes and trusts in Jesus are saved. Matthew 10 tells us that those who confess Jesus before other people publicly, Jesus will then confess them to his Father. And so I'd like to invite us all to pray a prayer together. For those of you who are praying this prayer for the very first time or surrendering your heart to Jesus for the very first time, I wanna, I wanna invite you to be bold and courageous and to take a stand publicly for Jesus. We want to encourage you, walk alongside of you. This life can be bitter. And it's not a matter of if the winds will blow and if the rains will come, it's a matter of when. We believe we have found the hope, the solid rock, Christ Jesus. So let's pray this prayer together. Repeat after me. Jesus, I am not perfect. For I have sinned, but I believe in you. Save me, change me, forgive me. I give you my life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Is there anybody in this house today making that decision for the very first time? I want to invite you right now to stand so that we can applaud you. All of heaven is already throwing a party on your behalf. Would you let us join you? Anyone in this house making that decision for the very first time today? Anyone making the decision that no longer be walking in their strength? God bless you. God bless you. Someone is making a decision to step from death into life. They've found the hope of Jesus. I think we can do better than that. God bless you. Come on. Let now be the moment. Is there anybody else who wants to make that decision for Jesus today? To walk in that hope, to walk in his peace, to trust him. Some of you have already made that decision someone has made that decision today and some of you are still considering that decision I want to encourage you to consider to continue to consider Jesus for he is the the sweetness of life even when life is bitter and now you and I have the opportunity to take of this bread have you have you ever been so eager to take of this bread and I loved it when, when David said at the end of the meal, the, the, the bread is it's broken and it's given to everyone at the table. Jesus has offered himself to every single one of us. And now we have the opportunity to receive him. This bread representing the body of Jesus, broken for us. Take and eat. And this cup representing the new covenant that is made with each and every one of us. This cup representing the blood of Jesus that was poured out, that was sacrificed on our behalf. Receive him, take and drink. Father, we give you thanks. We give you praise that the light of the world has come to us and is lighting up the darkness, not just in the past tense, but right now in the very present tense. 
we ask you to continue to come into our hearts, continue to flow through us. We give you praise as we've remembered the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Father, now as we consider our response to the generosity that you have shown to us, we give you praise. In the name of Jesus, all those who agreed said, amen. Let's give him praise now, church.
side to the blind. I believe that the dead came to life. One earth and the same. And you're still the same. I believe your wonders, sing of your praise, the God of creation knows you by name the lord is faithful yesterday now and always always your mercy is mighty age after age and all Well, amen. Uh, man, isn't it awesome when we can hear the kids join together in worship? It's, I mean, especially that song, Hosanna, what a blessing that is. And, you know, this morning, like Travis mentioned, we want to give you the opportunity online to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Uh, and the way that we do it is by texting follow to 42572. If you text that number, I'll receive it and I will call you. We'll send you a Bible. We'll send you Bible study tools. We'll send you any materials you need in your new journey for Christ. And we just want to celebrate with you. We want to get to know you. Um, and listen, we're so thankful uh, for everyone who joins in online. And when you think about all the prayer requests that we receive um, through all the services, if you're ever in the chat and you see a prayer request, I just want to encourage you, jump in. Jump in and pray for that person. And this morning we, we received a few here, but really, um, I just want us to join together as a church. And I, want to, I do want to lift up, as this is Jesus' triumphal entry week, it's beginning the, the Holy Week. Uh, as we mentioned, he, uh, David Brickner mentioned Israel, and I do want to do a special prayer for Israel. So I'd love for you to join me in prayer right now if you can. Please bow your heads. <clears throat> Lord, thank you for your goodness, God, your mercy, God, your love and your grace, Lord. Uh, the attributes that you bestow upon us, God. And Lord, I just want to lift up 
Israel right now, God. I want to pray for the church in Israel, God, the people in Israel, God, the people that are that are still hurting, God, uh, the buildings that will never look the same, families that will never be the same, God. Lord, we just want to pray, God, as as David was mentioning, Lord, as we pray for Israel, God, we want to pray for salvation for the Jews, God. We want to pray that they understand and come to an understanding of who you are, Jesus. And so, Lord, we lift up all of Israel, God. We lift up the church over there, God. We lift up the church as a whole, God, all around the world, Lord. We pray that you restore believers' faith, God. Bring those who don't know you to get to know you, Lord, through through your workers here, God. And I pray that... Um, as there were some prayers in the chat, God. We lift up Nolan, God, and um, his daughter, Lord, is praying. Pray for peaceful relationships, God. As she's a she's a young mom, God, and we just pray that you allow her to find some some healthy relationships that will help her, God. As she's going through what it is to be a mom, Lord, I pray that you you bring some people that will build her up from the church, God, and even in her community, God. And we just pray for um, everyone who is going through some family issues, God, people that are going through financial issues, God, people that are going through health issues, God. We pray that you cover uh, everyone in this chat, Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I don't want you to forget, Good Friday is happening this Friday. We're going to have two services, 6 and 7.30. We're going to be right here online. Love for you to join us. Love for you to invite somebody to watch it at your house if you can't come in person. And then on Easter, of course, we have four services, 7.30, 9, 11, and 1 p.m. I want you guys to join us for that as well. You hope you guys have a great week. to just sing this next song out in the spirit of surrender just say yes to Jesus just